Ace line for me while I'm going there. Well, good morning again, church. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. Join with us as we pick up here at Acts chapter 5. And uh, we left off last week at verse 21, but we're going to pick up there again this week. And so for those of you that weren't here last week, As we discussed, Peter and John have continued to preach in the name of Jesus. People are turning to Jesus as Savior. And as we talked about last week, the Jewish leadership, we saw sort of their their biggest issue in all of this is that they had become jealous of the disciples and what was happening through Jesus. And has them arrested, has has the the two arrested, uh, Peter and John, arrested. And during the night, an angel frees them and tells them to go straight back to the temple complex and continue preaching and doing what you've been doing. And it says, as we got to 21 last week, it says, in obedience to this, they entered the temple complex at daybreak and began to teach. And so that takes us to where we are this week at 22, picking up and realizing that. So what we discussed and we looked at last week uh, with Peter and John continuing to do what they're doing, they get arrested because of the jealousy of this Jewish leadership. They get freed in the night, and now we pick up literally in that next moment after they have come out of prison, right? So this wasn't, they got out of prison, took a couple of weeks to recover, you know, relax, kick the feet up a little bit. No, this is, they get out of prison, the angel says, go and do this in the temple complex, and they go and do. This is that same moment. So you can imagine if someone got arrested, and was then in jail for what they had done, got out, and then in that next moment that they walked out of prison, went back to that same thing they were doing. It wouldn't make sense to us, right, in our, in our humanness. Now, for those of us that aren't in law enforcement, it makes no sense. For those that are in law enforcement, they might look at that situation and go, yep, happens all the time. I don't know, don't work there. So anybody in law enforcement wants to clue me in later, you're more than welcome to. And so we see this, what happens here. So they instantly go back to doing what they were doing before because they were told by the angel of the Lord to do this. And so this is what we see happening in uh, the end of 21 into the beginning of 22. When the high priest and those who were with him arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin, the full senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the jail to have them brought. So they're already in there preaching. The high priest, the high court comes in, sees that, you know, wants to bring them in to have them talk to, sends orders to the jail to have them brought. So they didn't even come in a way to see them for what they were doing. But it says when the temple police got there, they did not find them in the jail. So they returned and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing in front of the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. And so you imagine this moment where, as the Sanhedrin in the high court, you kind of have to have this moment of, okay, what happened? Right? I, I, I know we put them there. We know the door was locked, and now all of a sudden they're gone. And so they, there has to be this moment of what happened. And if you're the jailers, this has to be a very scary moment because we have to realize that at this moment and at this time in life, if you were the jailer and the people you were under were guarding were gone, that was a death sentence for you. Could be a death sentence for you as the jailer if your people were gone. So it says, as the captain of the temple police and the chief priest heard these things, they were baffled about them as to what could come of this. Can you imagine? Have you ever found yourself so perplexed by something you couldn't understand how or why it happened? Right? We've had these moments. All of us have had these moments where you're just, you look at something and you're like, there's no way. There's no way. And so you imagine this moment, what they're having. It says in 25, someone came, reported to them, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple complex and teaching the people. And so now we have this moment where you had just told them, don't do this. And now you're finding out they're doing it again. Now put yourself in the position, and most of you can relate to this, as a parent of when you tell your kid, hey, don't do that. And the minute you turn your back and turn around, what are they doing? That thing they were told, don't don't do that. Right. As a parent, what's your response? Right. You think about that as a parent. What's your response? Well, it depends on any sort of factors. Right. Depends on how the day's gone. Is this the first offense? Is this, you know, have you had your coffee yet this morning? Are you hydrated? Have you had lunch? Right. All these mitigating factors happening. But we realize here that the mitigating factor, the, the most important factor with these Jewish leadership folks right now is jealousy. They're jealous of what's happening. And now these two, they have asked and told not to do this or else are doing it again. So then we get to 26. Then the captain went with the temple police, brought them in without force, 
because they were afraid the people might stone them. Not stone Peter and John. The temple police were afraid that the people were going to turn on them. And so we see what's happening here. That the people are in with Peter and John and the leadership of the time is becoming nervous, becoming jealous, becoming all of these things. So then we see in 27, when they had brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin and the high priest asked, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to bring this man's blood on us. And we just pause there for a moment as we come off Easter and what we study at Easter. For them to make this statement, it's laughable. Right? They are responsible for the court that put Jesus to death. Right? Not that they did anything that Jesus didn't allow them to do, but they are responsible. There, there's no reason to teach and bring the blood on them because they did it. Right? They were the ones standing in front of the leadership saying, crucify, crucify. Getting, hair, getting the Roman leadership to declare him a criminal and have him crucified. And so what the leadership here is afraid of is sort of the truth getting brought back on them. They're afraid of the truth coming out and it being more known that it was their push and their lead that led to this. And they're trying to stay away from it. But I love the response of Peter and John here where they said, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And so we, you think about that statement and there's a lot contained just in that sentence. Right? Because when they say this, they're not discounting the position of the council or of the court. They're not discounting the Sanhedrin. They're not disrespecting them. They're just simply saying, we have to obey God. Right? They're being respectful in the moment. And for us as believers, that's something for us to think about. That Do they line up with these people? Absolutely not. Do they agree with the teachings and what the Sanhedrin and what the, the Pharisees are doing? Absolutely not. But in this moment, they don't disrespect them. They don't tear them down. They just tell them, we have to obey God rather than men. So there's a way for us, church, to respect people in leadership while still doing what God has called us to do. I think we have to be careful today because it's easy for us in our society today to sort of get caught up in the idea of attack. And as we think about our lives as Christ followers, we have to understand that our example, our ultimate example is Jesus. And we think about his earthly ministry and how he worked inside of that earthly ministry. And we only see him show anger once. One time. And we think about God as the example as well. We look at what God does. God never defaults to attack. There's always multiple chances for people to change, to turn, to move away from something before the eventuality happens where God has to delve out punishment. And so we see here that they acknowledge their position, but tell them, hey, we've got to obey God rather than men. Then we get to 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And so we see here, Peter, they teach truth to them saying, hey, yes, you did this. But what? God exalted this man. God has done these things. God has brought him back for the forgiveness of sins. And so we see here, what's, what's Peter and John and the other apostles, what are they doing here? They're offering salvation to the Jewish leadership. They're offering them grace. They're offering them mercy. And so we see this for us as Christ followers today. What do we take away from this? When there are those that we may not necessarily agree with their position on things, it's not our job to attack them. It's our job to offer them Jesus. If we want to see change in the world, the best thing we can do is lead people to Jesus. That's what changes the world. 
So we see here what's happening. They're not ignoring the Jewish leadership. They're simply following orders from someone up higher on the food chain. Right? You see this a lot in our own lives. My kids are great at this, or at least trying to do this. They'll ask mom a question, right, and get an answer. And if they don't like that answer, what are they going to do? Not that I'm higher up the food chain, but they're going to come to me and try to get a different answer. And in the same way that if I give an answer that they don't like, they'll go to her, try to get a different answer. When we think about this in our own lives, we try to play this same game with God. When God gives us instruction, tells us to do something, leads us in something, instead of listening a lot of the times, we'll sort of ask somebody else. Well, let me bounce this off somebody else. Let me, let me figure out if this is really what needs to happen. Like God's not a good enough source. We see here Peter and John, they're not bouncing things off anybody else. They flat out say it. We must obey God rather than men. If anything should define us in our lives as Christ followers, it's that. Obey God. Obey. When we think about what that means, what does it mean to obey to do without question. To just do. And so we see what's going on here. And then we get to 33 and Gamamiel. And I, Gamamiel, I love his advice here. And I think it's just as important for us today as it was then. And so that's why we're going to look at it here. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So obviously not hearing what Peter and John and the other apostles are offering. They get upset. They want to kill them. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel. He's talking to the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin now. He's saying, be careful of what you're about to do to these men. Not long ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. And all of his partisans were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. That man also perished, and all of his partisans were scattered. And now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will be overthrown. We think about that and we pause for a moment here. How often in our lives as Christ followers do we see something happen and we don't necessarily agree with it or we don't think it lines up with us and our default emotion is to do what? Go after it. Tear it down. When the truth is, God doesn't need us to do that. If it's not of Him, He will take care of it on His own. Right? I don't know about you guys, but I have enough going on in my life that I can't worry about everybody else's stuff all the time. Right? It's enough to keep my own life straight. How about it? I mean, anybody else? You feel like you got it all figured out? Anybody? Because if you do, I want to take notes. Please tell me if you've got this thing figured out. I want to know. Basically, what Gamaliel is telling these guys here is stay in your lane. Right? Do what you do, but leave these guys alone. Because if it's not of God, it'll burn out. It'll go away. Then we get to 39. And he lays the truth on him. He says, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. Now you think about that for a minute. You think about a minute. These guys considered themselves men of God. They considered themselves men and the ultimate leadership for God at the time to be told, hey, you may be working against him. There's a show Courtney and I have been watching. We picked up. It's been encouraged by a few folks to us. I'll encourage if you're interested to watch. It's called The Chosen. And it's a story about the life and times of Jesus, about him. The first season uh, follows Jesus bringing in the disciples and a few of your, your favorite Bible stories. Uh, it's a really good show. It's free. You can download an app. It's called The Chosen. You download that app. You can watch both. There's a second season going on right now. It's absolutely free. I encourage you if you want to watch a good show uh, with a great message, Chosen is the way to go. Pick it up. Watch it. It's great. But there's a moment in the first season, and so no spoilers here because, it, you know, it's, it's Bible. You've read it. There's a scene in the first season with Nicodemus, and he's talking to one of his students. And this student is very upset about John the Baptist and the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. He's very upset because he feels like it's a threat. He feels like it's, it's demeaning to them as the leadership of God at the time. And Nicodemus turns around and he looks at him and he says... If God does something that doesn't necessarily find itself in Scripture, 
Would you tell God to get back in his box? And man, that moment hit me between the eyes. Because who were we in our humanity to question anything that God would do? And Gamaliel here is laying that kind of similar advice that, hey, if this is of God, you don't want to work against it. If this is of God, you can't beat it, number one, and you don't want to find yourself working against it, number two. But the other side of that is, is if it's not of God, he's going to take care of it himself. Right? How often do we find ourselves in our humanity trying to handle problems that only God can handle? When so often in our lives, what do we need to do? Stay in our lane. Take care of our own problems and our own issues. Let God handle it. Now, does that mean God may use you in the process? Absolutely. But don't try to shoehorn yourself into something that God hasn't called you to do. So then we get to this in 40. It says, after they called in the apostles, had them flogged. This, that means beat. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. So notice here, they didn't just let them go. They beat on them. And then they released them. And I love the response in 41 and 42. Because you can imagine, if somebody beats you up for doing something, you might be a little angry. Right? You might leave just a little frustrated, a little upset, a little bothered. And we get to 41, it says this. They went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. Now put yourself in the place of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership. Imagine that you have these guys flogged, which it's not, you know, when you think about flogging, don't think about it as some sort of gentle. No, they beat these guys bloody. This would have been a whooping unlike anything. This isn't like you think about when you, oh, you give your kid a spanking and they may cry, but there's no, there's no marks, there's no blood. There was blood, there was marks. This was a beating. Yet after that happens, what does it say they do? They run out of there excited. Now, I don't know about you, but in my human side, if that was me and I saw somebody, hey, we just got these guys whooped, and all of a sudden they run out of here excited, that's going to raise some questions. That's going to raise a few red flags in my thought of, of what's going on here. But in the same way, we think about this for us. That in the moments where we are, where we feel oppressed, or the moments where the world pushes in on us, challenges us in what we're doing, that we should rejoice in those moments that we would be counted worthy enough to struggle for the name of God. That we would be counted worthy enough. That the world would feel threatened enough by us in our relationship with Christ that it feels like it needs to come after us. That is what we should aspire to. We should aspire to, the, to the, be the level of that, that the world feels like we're a threat because of what we're doing to impact the people around us in the name of Jesus. And we can't do that if we're going around attacking everything else in the world. In these moments, we have to focus in on what it is God has called us to do. Because we see in 42 here, it says this, Every day in the temple complex and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that the Messiah is Jesus. And so what do we do? What do we take away from 42? We take away the understanding that for us, what should we do every day? Teach and proclaim the good news that Jesus is Messiah. Find a way every day. Find a person. Find some way every day to proclaim and to show someone that Jesus is Lord. To share the message. We talk about change, and I said this earlier, and I'll continue to repeat it. If we want the world around us to change, offer Jesus. That's what brings a change. It's time for us as believers to understand that and to push on that. To share Jesus in any way that we can. Even in the smallest ways that we feel like may be inconsequential. You never know. Sharing just that little bit of good news with someone at HEB or at the restaurant. Just telling them, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, can I pray for you? Just asking them, hey, how's your day going? Showing an interest in them. Doing these small 
things. We think about the example of Jesus and what he did in his earthly ministry. As you study scripture, what did Jesus do? He built relationships. He engaged people where they were. And he built relationships. He asked them how they were. Even though he already knew the answers, he'd ask them how they were doing. He'd ask them what was going on in their life. And he would listen. I don't know about you, church, but I feel like sometimes we miss out on that listening part. We're quick to offer advice. We want to offer advice. Sometimes it's better for us to just listen. And so my challenge to you as believers today, my challenge to myself, to any of us as believers today, is to find those people that we could share the good news with, that we could begin building relationship with, pointing them towards Jesus. Because the only hope for change in this world is Him. So often we find ourselves putting our hope in so many other things that ultimately don't matter. We think about the things that don't matter, right? I've seen people get so angry over a football game that their week is ruined, right? Makes no sense, right? Don't get me wrong. I like sports. I've got no problem with sports, but that shouldn't mess your week up. And, but the thing is, is we could replace football with any other thing that you find in your life that will mess you up and has power that you shouldn't let it have. This world will distract you if you allow it. We need to stay in our lane, focus on Jesus, and proclaim him to the world with everything that we have. Trust that he knows exactly what he's doing. Because ultimately, that's what it comes down to as a church. It comes down to it being a trust issue for us. Do we trust what God's doing? Or do we think that we know better? So think about that today, church. Do you trust what God is doing? Or do you think that you know better? Because if you think that you know better, i got news for you. You don't. I don't. None of us do. None of us have the wisdom that comes from an eternity. None of us have the wisdom that comes from the one who created the heavens and the earth, who built the universe with his bare hands, who spoke the sun into existence. None of us have that kind of understanding. To think that we would know better than him? Hmm. We have messed up. In the same way that we don't know better than the doctor necessarily. When you go to the doctor and you go to that person with MD in your name, I don't care how much Googling you've done. They went to school for it. If I get in trouble and I need a lawyer, I'm not going to try to do that myself. I'm going to go to someone who knows what they're doing. If I have a question about the law, I'm going to ask the lawyer. I'm going to ask the person who works in law because they know. In the same way, in these situations, I'm going to trust that God knows exactly what he's doing, even when I don't understand it. Even when I don't understand it, trust that he knows exactly what he's doing. So ultimately, at the end of the day, do you trust what God is doing? And are you willing to go out and teach and proclaim the name of Jesus to everybody you can, no matter how small you may think it looks like? With that in mind, let us pray. God, we just thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to study here. God, we pray that we would trust in what you're doing. That we would trust you because you have the ultimate wisdom. And I pray that we would be the hands and feet you've called us to be, that we would that we would be willing to offer you to anybody around us, no matter what it looks like to us. That we would be about furthering your kingdom because you alone are good. That we would offer you as the change this world needs, needs because it's the only change that matters. God, that we would put our trust firmly in you and not in anything of this world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand with us, church. Well, thank you for joining us this week as we continue our study in Acts. If you haven't heard yet, we are bringing back Sunday school and Wednesday nights. Sunday school will start back May 2nd at 945, and Wednesday nights will start back on May 5th. We'd love to have you come join us in person. Uh, until then, we hope you stay safe. Remember, we love you. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that, and we hope to see you very soon.